Hey everyone, I'm Julia, the Program Coordinator of Conservation Optimism, and I'm very excited to be with you today. If you've never heard of us, Conservation Optimism is all about moving away from the doom and gloom narrative that is often used to describe environmental challenges. And we also want to make everyone feel empowered to act for nature. Today, I am taking you on an optimistic journey in the Museum of Natural History of Oxford to highlight that the conservation sector also has many positive stories to share. So, that's all good, but you might think then, why are we starting in front of a dodo? You know, the dodo is pretty much an emblem of species going extinct, isn't it? Well, even though the dodo did indeed go extinct, and there's not much we can do about that, many conservationists have in recent years been working extremely hard to make sure that other bird species from Mauritius, that same island where the dodo was from, did not experience the same fate. In 1974, only four of Mauritius kestrels were known to exist in the wild, and that made it at the time the world's rarest bird. If you don't really know what a Mauritius kestrel looks like, you can see it on the right corner of your screen right now. So how did they get to such terribly low level, you might wonder? Well, it was a mix of different things, really. A mix of heavy deforestation, the introduction of new predators, and the heavy use of the very toxic DDT in the 1950s and 1960s to eradicate malaria. Conservationists decided to take quite an innovative approach for the time by focusing on the conservation of that species instead of trying to restore their habitat. And they did so by kickstarting a captive breeding program that included various groundbreaking techniques such as hen rearing, the release of captive bred and captive reared birds, and also the scientists removed eggs and nestling from nests in the wild and artificially incubated them to increase their chance of survival. What they did then is they just released them back in the wild, and since the start of this conservation program, the population has gone from four individuals to about a thousand kestrels. That's, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. And one thing that is even more amazing is that the successful techniques were then replicated and have helped other species to recover as well. So you can see here on the right side of your screen you've got the pink pigeon, went from 16 to 400 birds in 30 years. And they also helped the eco parakeet to recover that you can see on your left. Okay, so that was our first stop. Now it's time to move on to a completely different ecosystem and to dive in the ocean world. Okay, so you can't answer me, but I would like you to think about what might have caused the humpback whale's numbers to decline dramatically in the 1900s and 1920s. So now that you've had a thought about it, I'm going to tell you a story. In 1904, the industrial fishery based on South Georgia started noticing the marine mammals. And humpbacks became the first whale species to be targeted in the near shore waters around the island. As you might imagine, the numbers quickly plummeted to unsustainable levels. Whales had become so rare there that by the late 1920s, the ships could find and catch a few dozen individuals per year. It is estimated that 25,000 whales were caught over approximately 12 years in the early 1900s. So you can imagine how that ended up bringing the whale population in the western South Atlantic to only 450 individuals. However, there are now an estimated 25,000 individuals in the southwest Atlantic. So how did we go from a few hundred whales to a number that is close to 19% of the pre-exploitation level? Well, you might have guessed by now but that was by giving humpbacks a protected status from the 1960s and making whaling illegal. Scientists noticed that the species was declining drastically and they pushed for protections to be put in place. In the 1980s, the International Whaling Commission issued a moratorium on all commercial whaling, offering further safeguards for the struggling population. This example gives conservationists hope that wildlife population can recover from exploitation when proper management strategies are put in place to protect them. Now we're going to move to our next stop and this stop is about a species that was weirdly thought to be extinct and was then rediscovered. And you're going to see in a second why I said weirdly. So this story is actually part of um, a project called Lost and Found which brings to life the inspirational stories of those that never stopped believing and whose passion led them to rewrite the history of species they so deeply cared about. The goal of Lost and Found is to use the universal language of storytelling to showcase in narrative and visual format 
the most formidable rediscoveries of both vertebrates and invertebrates animals, as well as plants from five continents. So today I'm going to share with you a few of these stories as well. And our first one is about a giant turtle. Yes, you've heard that right. A species that big managed to remain hidden of conservationists for a little while. The species I'm talking about though is not the one that you can see here in the museum right now. Considered possibly extinct by the Agusian for over a century, our rediscovered turtles is the Fernandina Galapagos turtles. In 1906, an expedition launched by the California Academy of Sciences discovered and killed a single turtle on Fernandina Island. A new species discovered. What a great success! However, in the years that followed, the turtles known only from this single specimen seemingly disappeared from the face of the earth. In 1964, an expedition to the island discovered possible turtles droppings and bite marks, but they just couldn't find the turtles. Fast forward to early 2019, and a TV channel, the Animal Planet, joined with the Galapagos Conservancy for one final renewed attempt. A team was put together and went on a two-day trip to the hostile island to determine once and for all whether the species truly remained and catch it on camera. As chance would have it, they struck lucky. They first came across some fecal matter left by a tortoise and an accompanying tortoise bed. That's the indentation left behind in the ground by a resting tortoise. The hunt picked up as the team rapidly scanned the area for the individual that had left these traces. Finally, with impeccable eyesight and skills, one of the rangers sighted the turtles over two miles away, sheltering under a bush. The turtles was finally rediscovered. And it was a female, well over 100 years old. Although these giants can actually live for up to two centuries in all. Imagine, such a long life. Now it's time to move on to our next stop, so please follow me. And we're going to go through bits of the museum. Okay, here we are. So far, I've been talking about various animal species, but I really want to emphasize that it's important to remember that plants are also facing increasing pressures and that the extinction can impact entire ecosystems. Sometimes the relationships between plants and animals can be incredibly complex and intricate. Let's take the example of the Brazil nut. The Brazil nut has a very hard shell to protect its nut. You can see a photo here in the right corner of your screen. Do you have any idea of which animal might be able to eat it from the animals that you can see in front of you? Usually, most people tell me they believe it's the capybara, because, you know, it's quite big, it has really big teeth, so it seems like it would make sense that it'd be able to break such a hard nut. But actually, that is wrong. The agouti that I'm pointing to here is the only animal living in the forest where the Brazil nut grows that has teeth strong enough to break the shell. The agouti then access the seeds and hides some of them in the forest. Similar to squirrels, the agoutis then often end up forgetting where they've hid the seeds, hence allowing for new trees to grow. Brazil nut trees are sensitive to deforestation and only seem to produce fruits in undisturbed forests. They depend on agoutis for seed dispersal, on bees for pollination and other plants in the rainforest for their continued survival. So basically, if these other species disappear, so will the Brazil nut tree. But if properly managed, non-timber forest products provide income for communities living in and around tropical forests. In addition, they provide these communities with an economic incentive to conserve existing forests and reforest degraded forests. That's a win-win situation for everyone, both the nuts, the agouti and the local communities. Okay, now our next stop is very nearby. So I've been showcasing stories from quite far away places so far, if you're based in Oxford. But chances are that there might be conservation projects happening almost on your doorstep and you just don't hear about them. So this stop is actually a local success story from Oxford showcasing how a museum, a shopping mall and a city council can work together to protect the species. The Oxford Swift City project was created in 2017 to improve the outlook for Swifts in Oxford and has since been working to raise local awareness of the many ways that we can help these vulnerable birds. Swifts are very much urban birds and they're a symbol of the British summer. Unfortunately, they're in serious decline. The UK breeding population has decreased by 51% from 1995 to 2015. And this is largely due to loss of suitable nest spaces as old buildings are renovated or demolished. New buildings often lack the crevices these charismatic birds use as homes. And that's why swift bricks are 
really amazing. So if you Google it and you'll see that it allows for Swift to nest inside the brick. So lots of new buildings are now trying to incorporate these bricks to allow for the birds to still get habitats. And that's the case of the local mall here in Oxford of the Westgate. The Oxford University Museum of Natural History has been home to many generations of Swift over the years. And actually the study of this particular population, dating from 1946, is one of the longest ever continuous studies of its kind. The Swift's nest box are well hidden and accessing them involves a cramped climb to the very top of the tower. The museum webcam reveals this hidden space showing chicks growing each summer. The cameras have been installed in two of the nest boxes and the images are streamed online from May to early September. So I would encourage you to go and have a look when it's time. To gather crucial data for the Oxford Swift City Survey, over 40 survey volunteers were recruited and trained. It's pretty amazing. They managed to gather over 200 records in the first year of the project, which can be used by local planners, developers and ecologists. So that's very much a nice local story of how lots of different stakeholders can work together to achieve a common goal of protecting a species. Now we've got one last stop, but actually it's not really fully a stop because that's a specimen that the museum hold, but that is so fragile and so rare that it can't be shown in the museum, so it is safely stored somewhere. But I wanted to tell you about it because it's a pretty cool species. And so you can see what species I'm talking about in the right corner of your screen right now. The species that you can see is called the Wallace giant bee. The Wallace giant bee is the largest bee species on earth. To give you an idea, that's up to five times the size of your common and garden European honeybee. About the size of a thumb, that's pretty big for a bee. As it turns out, this king of bees had until recently only been seen a grand total of twice. Wallace, in the late 19th century was one. The second was a researcher by the name of Adam Messer who recorded seeing it in 1981. In 2015, an American nature photographer and bee enthusiast happened to be visiting an entomologist at the American Museum of Natural History. The purpose of the visit was to further his project of documenting all North America's many native bee species. But it would become so much more than that. As it turned out, both of these insect lovers had for years held a fancy of rediscovering the Wallace giant bee in the wild. A discussion of possibilities began and the two became united in their quest. When Global Wildlife Conservation launched their Search for Lost Species program, the pair applied it for a position and the bee made it to the top 25 most wanted species. Fast forward a few years to October 2018 and they are contacted out of the blue by a writer regarding a trip he and his colleague had planned to search for the giant bee. Talk about a dream come true. In January of last year, this band of four met in Jakarta, traveling onward to the remote region of the North Moluccas. The timing of course was no coincidence. The team had done the research and were targeting the mounds of tree dwelling termites for the burrows the females of the species dug in order to lay their eggs. But despite the expert guidance of two local conservationists, our team of intrepid insect hunters suffered brutally from the combined effects of heat, humidity and disease. The team tracked across two islands, scoring several dozen termite mounds without finding the slightest trace of Drained and defeated, the team finally considered their failures and set off to return back after five full days of intense searching. Tired and hungry, walking down an old road flanked by lowland forest on one side and fruit trees the other, one of them suddenly pointed out a low termite mound perched in a rotting tree just two meters from the ground. Approaching it warily, they were shocked to see a perfect round bee-sized hole in its side. Of course it didn't mean it was a bee's hole, but that sounded like quite a good start. Racing the tree from collapse, each one climbed up to inspect, and something stirred inside. He leapt hastily down. A head torch was retrieved, and the moment of truth arrived. It was a success! Couched inside its burrow, lined with a sticky resin, lay a sole female bee. One tiny but significant part of Wallace's legacy to the present day. And that's a wrap for our conservation optimism trail. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you are in need of more optimism, you can follow us on Twitter at hashtag conservationoptimism and find more stories of rediscovered species on lostandfoundnature.com. 
Have a great day. Bye.